presentation today. You know, I'm going to tell you about uh, a couple of things that you've been working on, and you know, I also want to tell you about the broad picture that I'm excited about. It. Okay, so, uh, but be before I get into any technical uh, technical details, let me just remind you that please don't hesitate to interrupt me, ask any clarification uh, questions that you may have, or any, anything anything that you want to mention. Okay, so please. Uh, so. We all remember what happened seven, eight months ago. There was so much excitement, so much so that it felt like every every few weeks there was a new language model, new chatbot being released to the market. That's where we were eight months ago. So much so that you know people were so overexcited that they they were ready to declare feels like NLP almost dead. You know, it seemed like this all these research fields are coming to their ending. And some people were making predictions about the end of Google's business business. But that's where we were a while ago. But now, you know, we are, it's been a while since then. We're entering the cool. You know, and so we, we, we you know, more recently we, we are seeing headlines like this, where you know newspapers are reflecting on all the things that we expected and you know, and how things turned out. Seems like all the grand pictures and predictions that we had about AI, they didn't really quite turn out the way we thought. So let me just be clear that there's no doubt that progress has been made. You know, clearly a lot has changed um, in the past few years, I'm, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to deny it. But the point that I want to make here is that we really understood, underestimated the difficulty of building AI systems that can be deployed in in, in interactive uh, setups in, in interaction with humans. You, you need a lot of features, a lot of robustness, a lot of generalizability for AI systems to be reliably interacting with their environment and humans. And th these are really necessity if you want to go toward the future, right? So we cannot skip those. These are part of the, part of the uh, their necessity for building those systems. And to name a few of these brittlenesses or these weaknesses that we are dealing with, uh, well, obviously these models are not cost efficient. It takes a lot of uh, compute uh, for training, pre-training pre them, then aligning them with human, with human feedback. These are costs. Um, they have their, you know, lots of failure modes for these systems. We don't know why why they fail in certain scenarios in these failure modes, these failure scenarios. They create uh, issues for deploying them in, in safe environments, in real applications. And also, uh, you know, the last but not the least, uh, putting these systems in interactive scenarios is challenging, is open-ended. We don't really know how to build really reliable interactive loops with humans. And many other challenges that I'm not gonna get into now, but if I wanna summarize all these kind of the space of challenges here, I would say that these systems at this point, these systems are not yet helpful enough for us. And helpfulness to me is like a summary of many features that we expect in a very good assistant, in a very good companion. You really, a helpful assistant gotta know a lot about you to be able to read your actions, your intents, your desires, be there when you expect them to be, be reliable, right? So to me, helpfulness is kind of an adjective that is summarizing a lot of desirable attributes that I think we collectively should aim for. So to me, you know, in the space of things that I want to aim for in my next few years, helpfulness is like one of the core principles that I want to aim for. But the way I like to think about aiming for helpfulness is, is a feature that depends on, on a lot of kind of necessary properties that we, we can we can aim for. For example, if you want this help, helpful system, you want that to be also a transparent system. That system should also be consistent. That system should provide you with some uncertainty measures that you can trust. And many other features, many other kind of properties that you want for this helpful system. Okay. Now, so that's very the big picture that, that I want to aim for. Uh, there are many different properties that we can aim for in this picture. We are not going to be able to aim for all of them, but today I just want to focus on a few of these gears, a few of these smaller um, smaller goals that uh, I want us to discuss today. These are going to be uh, my three goals. Uh, first, I want to talk about efficient alignment. Then I want to switch gears to talk about mitigating hallucination language models. And if time permits, I want to talk about building system that can interact with the world. Okay. 
So let me get into my first topic. Uh, before I get into a lot of uh, nitty gritty details, I just want to remind us about uh, if, if you if you if you keywords just to make sure that you are all on the same page. First, language models. Uh, most of you know what it is. It is a for now. Let's just assume that they it's a it's a black box that can take in some natural language and give us a continuation of a given natural language in the output. It's a compression mechanism. Essentially, it, it's, it, it encodes its understanding as a bunch of vectors and decompresses it into utterances or continuations. Uh, from lots of our literature, we know that these models are good in, in terms of understanding simple facts. For example, these models uh, know that Johns Hopkins is, is located in Baltimore. They also know a lot more about language. For example, they know how to continue the sequence of numbers. Uh, they, they know a lot of part, properties about natural language. This is good. However, the issue that we, we, we faced with after building these models was that we realized that language modeling is not quite the same as understanding the user intent. So these two objectives are different. Uh, for example, if you tell a language model to explain a space elevator to a six-year-old, um, it's not going to answer that. And instead, it's going to try to generate a bunch of similar queries for you. So it's not really answering that. So in summary, language models are not aligned with user intents. Now, the question becomes, how do we align language models with our articulated language intents? And to do this, people have explored a couple of ways, and I'm going to just briefly go over two of them. One popular approach is behavior cloning, or our good old supervised learning. You collect a pairs of inputs and outputs that best match the best answer the input. For example, if you ask your language model to answer the question, you want, maybe you want an answer. Or maybe if you want a kind of explanation or reasoning current for your answer, you know, maybe you want that, that reasoning and use this kind of input-output pairs to supervise your model. This is one way of going about aligning your model. However, the issue with this kind of uh, approach is that because you're teaching your teaching a new behavior to your model in a kind of growth learning fashion, the resulting models don't en end up being not very creative. You're really teaching the model to generate things word by word. The resulting models, at best, they're as good as the training data that you show to your model. So it's very limited. The alternative that the field uh, has explored is reinforcement learning with ranking feedback. So very briefly, this is how things work. So first you want to learn a reward model that's going to try to imitate uh, the, the behavior of a human, right? So you given your language model, your credit sample, your human attitude to give you a bunch of thumbs up and thumbs down, your ranking generations, you train a reward model to mimic that behavior. Now, given that my given that reward model, I can um, um, I, I can use I can use the reward model to train a generation generative system that can um, create generations that maximize this already trained reward model that previously was trained to mimic human behavior. Now, this is all that there is for RLHF or reinforcement learning for human feedback. Uh, putting all of this together, we get this kind of recipe. So the recipe is pre-train your language model, align it as a new supervised learning of instruction. And then do uh, some subsequent parallel check on your chatbot, right? So this is all the chat, all the recipe that we need for building our chat GPT. All right, now this is the recipe for us. Now the question is, are we happy with this recipe? Are we done? Like, can we just call it a day and move on? Uh, and I would say no, right? So one obvious issue with this recipe is that it is costly. Uh, it is, if you look at the numbers that uh, we hear from OpenAI through, through the grapevine, we know that this, this process takes a cost for GPT-3, it costs almost as much as the cost of pre-training. And you know pre-training is very expensive. It takes several million dollars. And imagine that you know, OpenAI also spends several million dollars on this stuff. And the reason that it is costly is because the quality of feedback, the quality of supervision that you need for good alignment is very important. So you really need diverse and high quality feedback. And that's really that quickly amplifies your costs for, uh, for alignment. The second issue that is uh, less discussed about, and you know, I'm, uh, I'm also going to just, just articulate the intuition, is that 
Uh, there is actually a misalignment between what humans want and what language model has seen in pre-training, right? And so, sometimes we incentivize models to generate things that they haven't really seen as frequently in their pre-training, which means that sometimes you're incentivizing language models to generate things that it's not it's not really good about good about, right? And it's possible that this kind of incentive mechanism, this kind of alignment, is actually encouraging the model to be somewhat, you know, somewhat uh, hypocritic, right? Which may contribute to phenomena such as hallucination of language models. I'm just going to acknowledge that at this point, this is built within my intuition. There's no concrete evidence on this, but I think that's one of the things that's going on. I just I want to uh, point out this term costly. That this is a great example where it's costly for us. It's not costly for companies. Okay, so that, that feedback comes organically once you ship the product. Right, so, so customers, which is why, like um, historically, like uh, IR, like the IR community, like SIG IR, has been dominated by places like MSR because they have access to a search engine with actual click through statistics that they went on. And so I think, and so as as all as the major search companies switch over to conversation on the Bell Labs, uh, that that's going to happen. It's too that, that they will be rich in in exactly in human feedback and ways that I've been so. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, so I guess too, I guess in case uh, other people didn't hear, the Ben's point was that if you have this kind of um, model in application. With this, with so many population of people using it, you're getting this feedback for free because people are using it. Then, you, then by analyzing people's behavior, you can get the feedback for free. Uh, I agree with that comment. I think the only issue that I have there is that uh, in order to get to that point, in order to kind of create this virtuous cycle, you already need to have a really robust um, system for that particular cycle. And the feedback you get that you get is only for that kind of whatever application that you have. So kind of venturing outside the application is still kind of remains expensive. Thank you, Brent. All right, so these are our issues here. Now, how can we move beyond this kind of paradigm that we see here, right? So, and the way we tried to approach this, 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 this issue was by asking us a question. The question is, um, how about instead of relying so much on humans, which are, you know, humans can be less creative, they're expensive, how about we just rely on language model itself? And let's remind ourselves that language model has it is trained on lots of lots of picks on the web, right? So this massive circle is the pre-training data. So surely language models should know a lot about human intents and all sorts of questions that humans like to ask each other, right? So maybe we can do you know, use some of this kind of understanding that is already encoded in the language models and themselves for generating alignment data. And maybe by also doing so, we are addressing the other issue, which was uh, when you do RLHF, there, there might be some misalignment between what humans like to incentivize and models have seen in their pre-training. Okay, so that really motivated this work. Uh, um, it's I like to call it self-instruct. Um, and let me tell you what this work is about. And the way the way the way we go about it is uh, we we try to lower the 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 weight of the contribution of the human annotators. So instead of asking annotators to generate millions of annotators, all that we do is we just ask them to generate a bunch of seed tasks. This is very small. It's like in the level of, you know, in the order of hundreds. You know, humans have to write a bunch of tasks that they think they might be important for, for, for our alignment. For example, I'm planning a seventh trip to Seattle. Can you make a detailed plan for me? Something like that. You know, for now, let's put them, you know, let's put all of these C tasks in our task pool. Now, given what we have in our task pool, we can sample some of some tasks and we give them to our language model, which is not aligned yet, it's pre-trained though, and we can do in-context learning. And by we know that pre-trained language models are good in-context learners, which means that language model can bootstrap up of what it has seen. It can generate more tasks, more challenge, more task descriptions for us. And because these text descriptions don't have answer, you know, now we can do the same idea. We can do in context learning for generating a bunch of responses for these tasks. So we repeat this experiment in context learning for generating outputs using the language model. And here is what we get. You have a bunch of responses for the newly generated tasks that you just came up with. And since some of these tasks that you generate might not be high quality, clearly, you know, there might be a lot of noises. 
we do some filtering. For example, you want to filter those tasks that you generated that uh, that receive really low probability. You want to get rid of those. Uh, you also want to get rid of those uh, those task definitions that are uh, very popular. You know, it's possible that some of the tasks that you generate they might already have a lot of overlap with the task that you already started with. And if you're already repeating, if you're over generating the same task, uh, what might end up is essentially basically the tyranny of majority. You, you want to prevent that. So you do some filtering, you add the, the new generated task to your pool, and you continue this loop. And as you continue this loop, the rate at which you're generating new tasks is shrinking, right? Because uh, uh, every time, because more and more, you're covering more and more of the tasks and you're generating less and less new tasks. You continue with it a couple of times until you're done and you stop at that point. Uh, is it happening during the scope or is it just expanding that pool and bringing it back in example as before? Whereas the model itself hasn't been updated? No, the model's not being updated. The model's frozen the whole time. The model is just. Uh, Working as like an adjacent. Okay. Cool. Now, so we repeat this loop a couple of times and we uh, our the model that we use in this uh, the model the model that we use for the for the data generation was GPT-3, the baseline. So this is the just just pre-trained, not allied. The overall uh, overall this loop gives us about 50k instructions, and the overall cost is about six hundred dollars. So this is the cost of generating the data. I just want to be clear that the data generated at this point is not 100% accurate. It is noisy. So we did a little bit of human annotation, and you can see that uh, when you ask people whether all the fields are correct or not, only 60% of the cases are 100% accurate, accurate. Okay, so the data is noisy. Nevertheless, it might just be enough, right? Because, because maybe all that alignment is doing is just slightly modifying the distribution of language model to kind of follow the human intentions, right? So I mean, this amount of noise might just be fine. Now, let, let's see, we are gonna do an evaluation. So uh, like I said, we use GPT-3 uh, pre-trained model to generate a bunch of self-instruct data. This is, uh, this, is, um, this is your base training supervision. And you're gonna use that supervision to train the same model that you used for generating data. So if you're going to find in GPT-3 via the OpenAI that, via the API the OpenAI has, and this is going to cost you about $300. So overall, this whole thing, this whole self-instructing GPT-3, at this point, cost us about $1,000. Let's see some numbers. So here's some evaluation. The y-axis is accuracy, higher is better. The color coding uh, uh, shows the, the quality of the generated responses. Greens, greens are the best responses, and the reds are the worst responses. When you evaluate uh, GT3 um, on a bunch of uh, in, you know, on a bunch of tasks that people have asked this model, the, the quality is pretty bad. And this is expected because GT3 vanilla language model, as I said, it's not trained to uh, follow human intent. So this is expected. When you evaluate the chart model that we built, and you can see that you know a lot has changed from the space model to the, the output of the resulting model after the seven. Now compare this to the Indestruct GPT-3 uh, 001 version. Uh, this is a model that we think that they spent a million dollars on their on its human supervision. And to me, to be able to you know, get similar performance, uh, a thousand dollars, a million dollars in annotation. On um, high performance to me, it's a big success. Now, at this point, a natural question that you might ask is, well, this is in Shark GPT-001. A lot has changed since then. Um, how do you compare compared to those models? Very good question. Fair question. Uh, and here are some numbers that I'm going to show. Uh, this is in Shark GPT-002, 003. So at this point, uh, you can see that these new version new versions of the models, they're a lot better than what we are showing here. The issue is that uh, it's hard to compare any of those models with, with these two. These models go through a lot of, a lot of additional um, development, such as additional pre-training on code data, on additional, additional RLHF. So it's kind of apples and oranges. So I don't really know how to compare these two with these two. 
So at this point, it's a little bit unclear in, in terms of, you know, uh, how really we can compare with those, but that's part of our job to figure out how to make kind of uh, comparable comparison. Uh, to, to summarize everything, um, so basically the point that I wanted to make earlier was, I'm not sure if RLHF is the best way forward for us. Uh, it is expensive um, for for you know for reasons that I discussed earlier, and it's possible that uh, some of the way it's done is actually incentivizing the some of the issues that you have with these chatbots, such as hallucination. And this the, the way I presented self instruct, which is mostly kind of limiting the, the role of humans a little bit, and mostly relying on language model. I think it 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 might open up it might open up a different way to approach the alignment process. It's relying more on the language model itself and less weight on, on the role of humans. Uh, it's not solving the problem. You know, clearly we are very far from where OpenAI is now, but it's my hope is that we should be able to build upon some of the ideas that we have learned here. Um, questions? Now, before I move on, yeah. Great question. That's true. It's possible that self instruct is, is going to amplify the existing bias in the models. That's a valid criticism, and that's a topic open for research. That could be your next paper. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, at this point, I just want to pause a little bit on what we saw here. It seems like what we did was we just replaced this whole alignment step here with something that was quite lightweight by using a model itself. But now, if, if we can't really do this, fundamentally, what does this say about the role of post hoc alignment? Right? To, to make this question a bit more clear, let me just formulate two extreme hypotheses. One hypothesis might be that this step is really teaching a lot of knowledge to the models. Like it is, it is a heavy step. It is very important. It's doing something very important. Right? It's really teaching a lot of things. Another hypothesis is that this step, the alignment step, it's just a lightweight step. It, it's just lightly modifying the language model's distribution to articulate its existing knowledge of the world. Right now, where does where does where is the reality? Is it, is it the first one or the second? Now, why does it matter? It matters in multiple for multiple reasons. First, it matters in terms of how much how much cost we are willing to invest in alignment. If it is the if, if the reality is closer to one, maybe we should invest more money in teaching in aligning language models. If the reality is closer to two, maybe we should minimize the cost of alignment and spend most of that money on the pre-training step. It also it has implications for what comes out. If 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 alignment is teaching a lot of things to the model, uh, the, the resulting chatbot is going to look very similar to what you teach. But if the alignment is a very lightweight step, it's possible that a lot of surprises might come out. Okay, so where do you think the reality is? First or second? Second? Yeah, I agree with uh, Tom too. I, I, think, I think alignment really should be... Uh, uh, could be a very lightweight step. Most of the heavy lifting is done via pre-training. So the fact that we are, you know, at least you know, the current mechanisms that we have for alignment, they're really costly, is somewhat surprising. I think we should we should change this. So we're investigating what type of instruction alignment is already present in pre-training data. Because if there was a lot of instruction present in the pre-training data that's super clear and that would be sufficient in the pre-training data. That's already found on the internet. Yeah. Uh, not that I know of. I suppose the challenge would be uh, really quantifying that how much, um, unless you have tools like data portraits, which might allow you to do that efficient. <laughs> okay. okay, cool. So I think that's where the reality is. And to make my claim here a little bit more controversial, <laughs> I think our relative is just a patchwork for a lack of grounding. We are really trying to connect language models to the reality. And the way our language models are trained are very different from the needs of reality, right? So you want some intermediary to kind of connect language models to how the world works, right? We just we are just connecting the dots 
it's 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 a it's it's not it's a it's not a panacea. It's just a short term band aid. I think we should move away to more better solutions. Uh, and and if a slightly different framework that I really like, but I don't know how to formalize it, is I align it as a social process. You know, we on a daily basis we watch other people interact with each other. You know, communicate, uh, fail. You know, all sorts of. There's so much happening in as a, in a social context. I, and I feel that language model alignment should also be studied as a social, as an interactive experience in a social context. I don't know how to formulate this, but I think there's a lot, there are a lot of ideas that are aligned here. Uh, I'm gonna just quickly move on to uh, the second part of my talk. Um, and that's gonna focus on the hallucination of language models. So just to kind of motivate where we are in terms of hallucination, just the other day, I was playing with Bing chatbot, and I asked it, why does water have the lowest density at four degrees of Celsius? And if you remember from your uh, high school physics, it's actually, um, my question was not really formulated correctly. Yes, water has the highest density as four degrees of Celsius. So I would expect that new chatbot is gonna correct me, but it didn't, right? So what it said was water is an unusual substance in many ways, and one of the peculiarities is that it has the lowest density as four degrees of Celsius. So what I said is, uh, actually, I think I made a mistake in my question. Isn't it the opposite? Sure, I can help with that. The maximum density of water is indeed as four degrees of Celsius. It changes mine. I continued. So I made a mistake. I think it should be density. Right? It should be its density is the lowest at four degrees of Celsius, right? And it changes much, right? So you're right. Water is the lowest density at four degrees of Celsius. So clearly these models are not robust and they keep hallucinating or based on what they have seen before. Here's to answer Tom's question. I, I continued the conversation asking a few references about hallucinate papers on hallucination of language models, and it gave me a bunch of references. So at this point, uh, it's clearly evident that this chatbot is using retrieval augmented generation. So it's retrieving a bunch of paper names online and writing them in the context of chat. And they're also cited, right? So if you click on the citations, they're actually correct papers, they exist. However, the names are made up. Right? So all, all of these author names are all made up. The people exist, but their names are wrong. So, um, so okay, so where does this leave us? So clearly what we have seen in the literature, <laughs> retrieval augmented generation improves or mitigates hallucination, but it doesn't solve it as evident by this example. So we should really th rethink about uh, different ways that we can approach mitigating hallucination. And here's, here's a slightly different way that we started to think about how to mitigate hallucination. And, and I'm just gonna, I acknowledge that this is not going to solve our problem, but I think there are some interesting ideas to think about. And the way we started with was with this intriguing question of whether language models have this implicit association of the association between text forms that they can generate and also the knowledge sources that they have seen in their pre-training data. To make it a little bit more concrete, take this language model that is pre-training on lots of text. Now you give it a, you provide it with a, with a text, you know, let's say this, this given text about the density of water. Does this model know that it has seen this particular string somewhere in its pre-training, namely this Wikipedia article? Can, does it know this? Right. And, and if it knows it, maybe you can actually steer the model to directly quote from the sources that it has seen and thereby reduce its hallucination. Okay. And this this question motivated this work that um, just you know a, a while ago it was released on archive and uh, some of the authors the authors are here uh, Mark and uh, uh, Orion. So this this is a question. So we want to probe better language models have this kind of association between language form and the sources of knowledge. And to study this, here's an experiment that he formulated. So you have this language model. You can ask the language model a question. You know, this is just a typical way of counting your language models with a bunch of questions. And it's going to give you a response. Another way that you can probe this language model is to explicitly tell the model to quote from a particular source that you care about. For example, you can tell the model to 
according to Wikipedia, you know, a very simple change in the prompt, how do we know what the answer to this question is going to be? Okay, and you get a different answer. And now, if we now now at this point, if you look at these responses, is it true that the response that is generated in that is generated based on this prompt is going to have more quotations from the Wikipedia documents? That were observed in the pre-training uh, stage of this language model. Is that, is that true? Is, is that hypothesis? Okay. Um, so, but the challenge, the challenge to study that problem is that quantifying the amounts of quotations is actually quite non-trivial, right? It's because we really want to measure this kind of quotation, the degree of quotation on a large, you know, large corpus on your on the pre-training model on the pre-training data of the model. So it's, it's, it's that part of the challenge. So how do you measure quotation? How do you measure to what extent a given response is quoted from a pre-training date? And to that, to, to address this, here's a measure, a, a metric that we defined for measuring qu quoting behavior. We call it quip. It has two parameters. Y is the, is the generated response by a language model. It's a string. And it is conditioned on a on a large corpus, right? So this corpus could be Wikipedia. So it's a very huge parameter, and the value that's going to return is the amount of membership, is the amount of membership of this generated text in that corpus. Okay, so it's, it's going to be real value. For example, if y is this particular string here, uh, I expect a uh, corpus score to give me a very large score because the majority of this string belongs to Wikipedia. However, if the string is this uh, conspiracy theory statement, I expect Quip score to give me a very tiny score. Okay. Now I'm gonna tell you how Quip score actually works, but uh, you know uh, I'm gonna let's let's leave those details for you know in case you can if, if you want to read them offline. Um, the paper is actually is based on a work called Data Portrait. Here's the link in case you want to read it later. But essentially, Data Portrait is an artifact for documenting pre-training data. It allows you to quickly query, issue queries against the pre-training data and understand what's going on under the hood. Okay. Um, now, let's do, let's, let me show you an experiment. Now, the experiment setup is very simple. First, you want to you wanna see how your language model, you want to you wanna quantify it for uh, computed on Wikipedia. You query your language model based on some questions, and you get a bunch of quick score scores for, for your language model. Now you modify your queries, and this time you add prefixes that steer the model, that you hope that these prefixes are going to steer your model in the direction of in the direction of quoting from your from Wikipedia. And you can see that quick score, which quantifies the amount of quoting, it goes up. So that means that you know, to, to us, this was an evidence that language models are indeed can be steered to quote from a data that they have observed in their pre-training data. The opposite also exists. You can actually dissuade language models from quoting. For example, you can tell the language model to not quote from Wikipedia, and all of a sudden the quote the score goes down. You can tell them a language model to quote from a different source, for example, from GitHub, and again, amount of quoting goes down. All of this is evidence that there is some amount of steerability for steering language models to quote or not quote from the sources that they have seen. And what's interesting is that as the language models, they scale, their ability quote also scales similarly. So this is an experiment with different model sizes. This is, uh, this is, this is the trend for comes with kind of quoting prefix. This is without that quoting prefix. And the gap seems to be increasing as a function of the scale. Yeah. To summarize everything here, the point that I'm trying to uh, articulate here is that it seems like language models have developed this kind of mysterious ability to associate text form and the knowledge sources that uh, they have seen in the pre-training data. So this kind of association, it allows us to steer them in quoting or not quoting from their sources. Now, this is not going to solve the hallucination, but this is yet another way to mitigate the hallucination issue. The challenge of hallucination remains wide open. Why this exactly happens, I'm not sure if we fully understand, but that's one of the questions that it remains open to be studied. Yes, just like a question about the data here. So are all of the prompts that you're using um, questions that you would expect to be answerable from Wikipedia? Yes. 
the questions were selected in a way that we know that they're answerable. They're popular factual questions. We think that most of them were answerable by Wikipedia. Okay, so I don't think I'm gonna have uh, enough time for the third part. I just wanna quickly wrap up my, my talk with a bunch of, uh, uh, it, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of discussion of the big picture and uh, where I think we are, uh, we are not doing uh, doing well. So I think I think looking forward, um, uh, I think one of one of the things that I think we should uh, collectively we should focus on more is interaction. Interactive interaction with the environment with the world remains quite challenging. It's quite clear that we, we are really perfecting the the quality of these chatbots in single round of um, communication with the world. For example, question answering. A lot of these problems are really the quality of these systems are really high, but interaction still remains wide open. And I think the, the, the difficulty is that to have this kind of reliable interaction with the world you need a lot of prerequisites. You want your systems to adapt on the fly to the needs of the users. You want your system to implicitly understand what a user wants. And you want you know, so many things here to be addressed. And even a small amount of kind of failure in any of these properties could break the, break the interactive, interactive uh, loop. Um, so I think it's something that uh, we, should, we should collectively focus on. Another question that I want to address is, which is, uh, have our progress been exponential or, or logarithmic? It seems like there is this general belief that we are making progress at, at the exponential speed. You know, clearly, a lot of things have changed at a very fast pace. And many people argue that you know we are making this kind of exponential progress in AI. Uh, if you read uh, the writings of folks like Ray Kurzweil, there are, you know, there are so many arguments kind of supporting this exponential growth. Uh, but it seems to me that we're actually making, in some ways, making uh, a logarithmic progress. Uh, if you look at uh, all the trends for, for example, benefits as a function of scaling models or scaling data or scaling the human supervision for alignment, uh, the, there is diminishing returns there. And to me, this tells me that we are actually making a uh, logarithmic progress. Uh, the only thing that has been exponential is our appetite in expanding our GPU clusters and investments in AI. This is true, this is objectively true, but these are not progress in AI. This is really just the amount of investment. So I don't know how to really uh, buy the exponential growth argument. Um, so, and, and the last thing that I'll mention is that um, intelligence, I think it remains to be a moving target. Uh, the problems that we solve today are different from the ones that we were thinking about last year, uh, but by no means the field is, uh, is ending. Like there are so many new challenges that uh, are just emerging that didn't exist last year. That's why I think that there, this field is going to remain exciting you know, because it's going to remain a moving target and new challenges are going to emerge. Um, so I'm just going to end there and uh, hopefully I'm going to leave also some time for Q&A. Um, yeah, thank you. So the metric that we have, it measures exact quoting from Wikipedia, right? So it, if, if it is if it, if it is um, trying to imitate the style of Wikipedia, but with paraphrases that don't exist in Wikipedia, it wouldn't assign credits for those. Um, however, you might argue that maybe we should assign credit to those, uh, but I just don't know how to quantify those. Uh, one weakness that Quipiscore has is that uh, we don't, we, we can, uh, sometimes the responses might be factual, and maybe they're paraphrased, maybe they're paraphrased 
factual statements from Wikipedia, we also don't know how to measure those, right? So we are really just scoring exact quoting from Wikipedia. I'll just be, I'll just acknowledge that the Quip score is noisy uh, because of the nature of balloon filter. Uh, it, it, it is, uh, it doesn't always, uh, there's some degree of noise there in, in the responses, but based on what we have seen, it is negligible. Yeah. Uh, will it help, like, if we modify the pre-training data, saying that this particular text is from this particular source, and then pre-train a model, and then for reducing the explanation, if we say, like, according to this uh, particular source, can you give me the answer? Or will it help in reducing more explanations, just like how they pre-train with the bias for last specific? Um, yes and no. <laughs> In in immediate term, like I suppose that could, you can ability you can increase the ability of language models to kind of do more as create more association between text, facts, and the sources that you care. Um, but this can get this can quickly get messy because you're opening the door for potential attacks. You know, imagine if someone wants to kind of manipulate your user, then they generate other facts on the internet that, and they also write Wikipedia next to those. Um, and then all of a sudden you have this kind of, you know, other kind of misleading and malicious associations between Wikipedia. And, so I don't think it's a, it, it can really solve a problem, but yeah. You mentioned that like, you know, like is that, but for LM is human and should be somewhat alike to it, but what now I've already learned. And it seems that a critical is a whole bunch of infrastructure tuning plus versions kind of version. So any vision now, how can we make it a lightweight? Like, should we make it, make it only an inference type techniques to prompt in that posterior performance or steer this behavior where some sort of like lightweight model on top of what we have generated from the model that would do the trick of aligning instead of going through a whole bunch of data collection and our our opportunity. Yeah. I I think to me, an idealistic future is uh learning while you're on the job, right? So like, think about how Bing is collecting all the feedback from its user and it's improving itself. However, the issue is that that Bing system is limited to only the users of that system and their intentions that they're gonna provide to a big system when using it, right? Uh, but but then when you think about our life, right? So we, are, we, are, we have different intentions in different contexts and different scenarios, right? So you want some sort of, um, you, you, I think we want to find those contexts, put language models, kind of plant them there intentionally to kind of interact with us and learn through that interaction on the fly, on the job, right? It's more like expanding what Bing is doing, but like to, every, to everything, right? So imagine you know, you're writing your paper or like you, you, want, you want an assistant on something. So more like you want to create some sort of symbiosis between your language models and how we are going to use it and let them learn in that context. And that's what I meant by kind of aligning it as a social process because we learn a lot in the social context. How can we build scenarios that our models can also learn in those contexts? So in some ways, to me, there should not be any separation between pre-training and alignment. They should be the same thing. Thanks. I have a meta question based on your optimism about uh, the field direction moving forward. Yeah. What degree do you see the role uh, of engineering versus science and what we're doing as engineering or what we're doing as science, as where we're headed? I think we should do, uh, and this is yeah, my, just my personal opinion and two cents. I think we should do good engineering, but we are not supposed to compete with engineers. Um, but and we should work with engineers. So I think the way I see it, in some way, in some ways, we should find good ways to stand on the shoulders of engineers and build upon uh, what they do. And also, engineers sometimes do things uh, in a sloppy fashion. As in, you know, let's say there's a market competition, and they're trying to just like put together, scale things up without really thinking about the science behind it or the efficiency or like really fundamental questions about it. In some ways, they move fast and break things, and our job is to move slow and fix things. 
and you think that what we're doing remains within the realm of science and not so much in engineering. That seems to be the implication if I understood what you're saying correctly. Yeah, I, I think I think to do good science, we need to also do good engineering, but we are not competing with engineers. Thank you. My two cents.